Okay, well, I guess we can start. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to each and every one of you from wherever you are on the globe. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Um, please continue to use the chat. Please continue to let us know what's your name, where you're from. It's my pleasure to have you with us today um, for this joint webinar organized by the International Trade Center, the WTO Informal Working Group on MSMEs and the Global Legal Entity Identifier Foundation. I am Dario De Quarti. I work at the International Trade Center and I'm very glad you decided to join the, this session. I promise it's going to be one hour really interesting for you. We have three amazing tools to present you. So please stay tuned up to the end. There will be also a lot of time devoted to Q&A. Um, and, and yes, let's go. So we entitled this uh, webinar Trade Made Simpler, and we believe it will bring you practical resources to help you successfully engage in new trade opportunities in new markets. And you know, the, the world is fastly changing. There's many new opportunities. According to um, a recent survey by EY, more than half of the large global firms surveyed are planning on making changes to their supply chains in the next 18 months. So this means many things, but in particular that changing trade policies are a desire to shorten or to diversify supply chains. And this will create new trade opportunities. And we wanted to ensure here at ITC with the WTO Informal Working Group on MSMEs and with the Global Legal Entity Identifier Foundation, we wanted to ensure that you can make use of these practical resources um, as well as you can. Let me begin with a few housekeeping rules. You can use the chat as much as you want. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we will be very glad to answer them. You can also use the Q&A function. Please use the Q&A function as we are um, really looking forward to answer all your questions. And now let me introduce briefly our three amazing panelists and speakers for today. So first we have the honor to be with Claire Rowley. Thank you very much, Claire, for being with us. Um, Claire, you are the head of business operation of the Global Legal Entity Identifier Foundation. But prior to working with Glyph, Claire worked at the United States Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, where she led technology initiatives, improving bank resolutions program, and she also contributed to research on subprime mortgages. Claire is also a CFA charter holder and holds a master's in predictive analytics from Northwestern University. Thank you, Claire, for being with us today. It's a pleasure to have you here. We also have Katrin Lundquist with us. So Katrin, it's a pleasure as well to have you here. You are an economic affairs officer in the economic research and statistics division at the World Trade Organization. And at the WTO, you support the WTO micro, small and medium sized enterprise informal working group. Um, this work includes a lot of things, but in particular research on MSMEs and trade related topics, such as MSME references in RTAs, small business and climate change and MSME digitalization. And in 2021, you also helped the group develop the new Trade for MSMEs web platform, an online resource for MSMEs and policymakers. And this Trade for MSME web platform will be presented today. Please stay tuned because it's, gonna, it's going to be really a very useful tool for your, for your trade journey and for your exporting journey. So thank you very much, Catherine, for being with us. It's, it's a pleasure to have you here as well. And last but definitely not least, from ITC, we have uh, Mrs. Anya Jankowska Eriksson. Thank you, Anya, for being with us today. Anya, you are market analyst in the ITC Trade and Market Intelligence Division. Um, Anya is also a trade economist that had worked in supporting trade led growth in various roles across the OECD, the World Bank, uh, the, the World Economic Forum, sorry, and the, and the ITC. Thank you, Anya, for being with us. And I hope this introduction gave you a bit of uh, interest for this webinar. I promise it's going to be a great session, but I've talked enough. I'll directly hand the floor to Anya because Anya will start the presentation. Um, please continue to use the chat if you want, if you just joined us to, to tell us who you are and where you're from. And Anya, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dario, and uh, really a pleasure to be here with all of you from so many places uh, around the globe. Um, my, today in this session, I would like to take a moment to introduce you to a multi-agency tool called the Global Trade Help Desk. So I'd like to just uh, take a few minutes to give you an overview, a quick presentation of kind of what it's about and how it works, and then do a quick demo, and then also ask you to see to, if you could use it yourself and do a quick interactive exercise. So if you you will allow me, I will just quickly share my screen and bring up my presentation. 
Perfect, Tanya. Looking forward to your presentation. Just wish to know before the commencement what will be the gain and benefit of the seminar to the participants. Well, as many as you can imagine, but it's going to be a lot of resources presented for MSMEs uh, that can uh, that that need these practical resources that are mostly free. So, so please stay tuned. Anya, the floor is yours again. Thank you so much, Dario. Uh, so. The reason that the Global Trade Help Desk was, was created or the reason it came about is that a lot of small and medium enterprises um, are very interested in trade and are very interested in exploring international opportunities, but they tend to get overwhelmed by all of the different sources of information out there and there's so many different places to look and not really knowing how to put the puzzle together and not knowing which information is credible and which resources they should use when. So in terms of actually the market research process in particular and identifying and comparing different opportunities, um, we decided to create joint forces between uh, 11 different agencies to create something called the Global Trade Help Desk. And the idea is that we would like you to have a single entry point to the most uh, up-to-date information that we can provide from across ITC, but also the WTO, UNCTAD, the World Bank, World Customs Organizations, UNIDO, a number of different actors, uh, because we really believe that it's important and that we can work together to make life easier for small and medium enterprises. So. In June 2020, we launched uh, this platform, the Global Trade Help Desk, which is available in six languages at the moment, English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Russian, and Arabic. And what it really tries to do is to, it's a little bit like a, like a Google search, if you will, on trade, right? You, you, you put in three search criteria. Uh, unfortunately, we can't just put in one for the moment. It's three. Um, and the idea is that it will bring together um, in one search uh, some of the key information that you need and also um, provide you what are the underlying bases of information so that you can dig deeper if, if needed. Um, and... Uh, as Dario already said, um, this is one of two platforms that we'll present today. Um, after my brief introduction, Catherine will also prevent, uh, present the Trade for MSMEs platform. And the idea is that um, these platforms together can kind of guide you through the trade journey. Global Trade Help Desk can help you with um, the specific data research and analytical aspects. And Trade for MSMEs can show you where the path will lead you and also connect you with resources across so many different areas. So the idea is that using these resources together, um, hopefully you will uh, be able to navigate this process much more easily than, than without them. So what does this mean in practice? Um, we wanted to take just an example to show you what this might mean if you are an Indian rice exporter so or a rice producer thinking about exporting. So first, you might consult a guide on trade from SMEs to understand what is the export process like? What are the basics of exporting? Then you might consider, are you ready to export? And really taking a few tests to make sure that you have the resources, the strategy, the plan to be able to enter new markets. Next, you might go to Global Trade Help Desk to look at different market opportunities. Perhaps the Saudi Arabian market could be of interest, perhaps other markets, but allowing you to understand the economic potential, but also get um, more uh, detailed information about market access and other conditions. Um, next, you might be interested, once you've decided which market to go to and perhaps found a buyer, you might be interested about how a model contract might look, what the INCO terms involved might be, and perhaps also consider some trade finance options. So these are all resources that are available through Trade for SMEs, as Catherine will show you a lot more about um, later. Um, next, you might think about what are the actual procedures, the trade procedures and the institutions that are involved. So um, Global Trade Help Desk can help you identify um, who the partners are and also um, what uh, the actual procedures are and who to connect with. So, um, uh, and then you might also be interested in finding information about how technology can help your business in general. So have you considered e-commerce? Have you thought about electronic and digital payments? All of these aspects, which are really crucial, especially for harnessing opportunities in the digital economy, are also covered in trade for MSMEs. So, and 
at some point will also uh, aspects might be included in Global Trade Help Desk in the coming months. But um, just to give you an overview of since this question came up of like, what specifically could a business gain from these platforms and from this webinar? Um, after this hour, you will definitely feel a lot more comfortable um, knowing where to find information and also perhaps how to put it together for an effective business strategy. So in terms of the market analysis process in particular, um, what I'd like to take you through using Global Trade Help Desk is first looking at the economic attractiveness of a specific market. So analyzing the historical demand and also looking at forward-looking forecasts. What might you expect given global growth conditions? Second, um, I want you to think about how much will it actually cost you to enter these markets? So both in terms of the tariffs and the duties in, um, involved, but also more importantly, what are the regulations which tend to be quite different across different markets and will have a, an important compliance cost as well? And then also thinking about sustainability and, and looking at niche markets, since this is a really growing trend in international trade. So making sure that uh, perhaps if you'd like to reach um, fair trade or organic market uh, segments, like what would be involved and who would you need to partner with to do that? And last but not least, um, we want to give you some ideas about who might be relevant trading partners. So we have some information about potential buyers. We have trade finance providers. Uh, we have logistics uh, providers in terms of freight forwarders. So different people that you might want to consult as you're thinking about implementing your strategy. So um, what I wanted to do quickly is uh, instead of talking about the platform, I just wanted to quickly show you how it actually works. So I'm going to go into the Global Trade Help Desk, and I'd like to take the example just uh, as an example from India to Vietnam, uh, looking at uh, pepper and neither crushed nor ground, 090411 in the Global Trade Help Desk. So I will stop sharing for a moment and share the Global Trade Help Desk instead. Are you able to see my screen again? Yes, think... perfectly. Thank you, Anya. Excellent. Thank you. So um, as I mentioned uh, in my introduction, uh, the Global Trade Help Desk is available in all of these languages. So if you feel more comfortable with another one of these, please feel free to switch. Also, one thing I wanted to flag is that um, in case you are exporting products uh, that might be impacted by um, the war between uh, Russia and Ukraine and would like to know about the temporary trade restrictions that are in place, um, the link at the top in this uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine um, can show you the temporary trade restrictions that have been enacted um, in the market access map database there. So in case that's relevant, please uh, feel free um, to look there. There's a login button. The login button um, is relevant for accessing company information specifically from trade maps. So um, getting a trade map account is free from most countries and uh, it allows you to have the most detailed information, but most of the information is available without login. So without further ado, I'm going to put in India as the exporting market. I'm going to select um, oh, the, for product. I wanted crushed pepper. So 090411. Oh, so not, neither crushed nor ground pepper. Um, if I don't know what my product code is, I can also type in a keyword and uh, the keyword search will help you identify um, the product as well. If you already know which market you're interested in, you can go directly type that in. Or if you're interested, you can push the find markets button and this will bring up export potential forecasts uh, for uh, exports of the specific product from India. We can see that Vietnam is the largest market with 26.7 million in expected or potential exports uh, per year in the coming five years. And other target markets could be USA, Germany, uh, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Egypt, and so on. In this example, we wanted to just stick with uh, Vietnam. So I will click on go and it will take me to the market overview. And this is just a summary of what we believe to be some of the key information to give you a quick glance is, is this market worth really um, looking at? So here, first, we have an idea of the market size. We can see that Vietnam imports 76 million um, in terms of 
pepper last year. It's the five lar fifth largest importer in the world. We can also see um, what is the bilateral relationship between India and Vietnam in this product. India only has 1% currently of this uh, of the market share. Um, it did grow about 19% uh, per year in the last five years, and the estimated potential is 26.7 based on the strength of the trade relationship and the fact that um, Vietnam is importing this product from many other um, other suppliers. So we can see here that um, imports peaked at 13.8 million um, in 2015, and in the last available year, it was 1.2 million. So there could be considerable room for growth for this product. Next, we can see uh, what is the tariff profile. So we can see that um, Vietnam's tariffs range between zero and 20% for India. So we can see that there is a um, FTA, an ASEAN India Free Trade Agreement, and that the MFN duty applied to all WTO members is 20%, but the preferential tariff for India is 0%. We can also see the national tariff line. We can see that there's white pepper, black pepper, and other that are considered um, in Vietnam. So in terms of what is the rule of origin, what would you have to do to get this 0% duty? We can see that you need a regional value content of 35% or a substantial transformation. So, and you can find further details about exactly what this means uh, in uh, looking more detail at the rules of origin information. Returning to the market overview, now that we know how much it's gonna cost us in terms of tariffs, we can also explore what are the regulations in place? We can see the regulations both for India, the domestic requirements, but we can also see in Vietnam, what are the product requirements, market conditions, and the pre-shipment and inspection conditions, as well as the notified regulatory changes for SPS and TBT, um, sanitary and phytosanitary uh, regulations from the WTO. So, for example, um, we can see that there are tolerance limits and residues uh, that are relevant for this type of spice, and we can see what are the regulations that are in place, um, including links and the full text to them. So a company could go through and explore this information in detail. I won't drag you through all of the regulations because there are quite a few, but the idea is to just give you a sense of what information is available. Um, now, in addition to this, uh, we also have information on sustainability standards. So um, if you're interested in finding out more about what are the fair trade or the organic or, or other options that are uh, certifiable in India, but also accepted in Vietnam, this information comes from a sustainability map and you can find um, the information on sustainability map, which will give you really concrete details about what are the requirements involved for this private standard that's not mandatory, how do you comply with it, how, what are the costs, and get all of the detailed information so that you can really think about whether this could be relevant for your business as well. So once you have an idea of how much it costs, how you could reach niche markets, um, we have some uh, general information proxies from the World Bank about uh, time and cost to export, uh, but that's at a general economy level. And then we have information on potentially importing companies, trade finance providers, trade promotion, or, or, uh, trade promotion organizations, IP protection, and freight forwarders. So... A lot of people tend to be interested in potential buyers, so we have information that comes from Connect Americas that we can see here, and then we also have additional information coming from TradeMap. So this comes from Dun & Bradstreet or Compass, so here for herbs and spice plants, I can see there's uh, potential importing companies of 159, and you can see all of the company information here, including the websites whenever we have those available, so you can potentially reach out and contact them. Um, and that brings us to the end of our market overview. And at the bottom, if we're not fully convinced by the Vietnamese market, we can also consider alternatives. We can see what UAE might look like and have all of the same information um, broken down once again. So um, I will stop sharing my screen for a moment and I will ask actually you to do a quick search yourself.
So I will return to my PowerPoint. Thank you very much, Anya. There is a question, maybe we can answer to it later, um, but we will answer all the questions. So please continue to type them in the chat. Okay, so um, I would ask you just very quickly um, if you could go to Global Trade Help Desk. Um, Adelia, perhaps you could put it in the chat um, if it's not already there. Um, and I'd like you to just look at um, the export from India to the USA of tablecloths, cotton tablecloths. And the, the code is 630251. And I just have three quick questions to ask you based on, uh, based on your search. And I ask you this just to see if you can conduct the search yourself. And if you have any questions uh, while using the tool, it will make it easier for us to make sure that, um, that we're all on the same page. So um, once again, India to US, uh, product code is 630251. And I hope you are able to see a, a quick poll with three questions. Yes, we are. One being what is the market share? Uh, what is India's market share for tablecloths in the US, cotton tablecloths? What is the value imported uh, from India in 2022? And what is the maximum tariff uh, that India charges or, or that the U.S. charges uh, to um, Indian exporters. So if you could take two quick minutes to just do the search and see if you could find the correct answer. So you type uh, India as the exporter, the product code is 630251, and the target market is the United States. I can already see several of you participating. Thank you for that. Wonderful. One last 30 last seconds. If you could lock in your answers, that would be excellent. All right. Thank you so much. I am going to show the results. So most of you believe that the market share was 75%, which is correct. Uh, in terms of the value of import, uh, um, in the US from India in particular, the correct answer was 152.1 million. I will just make sure everyone can see that in a moment. And in terms of the highest tariff, it was actually 6.3%, but very close. So let me, uh, let me show you how to get that on Global Trade Help Desk, and then we move on to Catherine. So are you able to see my screen? Not yet, but maybe it is coming. <laughs> Maybe I didn't share it. Works better if I do that. How about now? Now it's perfect. Okay, thank you. So once again, India is uh, our exporting market, and it was uh, 630251. And then we have uh, table linen, and then uh, the United States was our target market. United States of America. And what we can see here from the market overview is that total imports from the U.S. to the world were 185.6, but imports from last year from India were 152 million. The market share was indeed 75%, as most of you found. And in terms of the tariff, we can see that it ranges between 4.8 and 6.3%. And the way that you can see which one has, which tariff line has the highest percentage is that you can click between them. So you can see actually that other uh, not elsewhere specified tablecloths that are not knitted or crocheted had the highest tariff of 6.3%, whereas other ones had other types, uh, other levels of duties. So this is where you differentiate because tariffs are applied at the national tariff line. So thank you for your participation in that. Now uh, I will very soon pass the floor to Catherine, but I just wanted to um, say one last thing. And that is um, what you can expect, what additions you can expect on Global Trade Help Desk in the coming months. Um, in the next couple of months, what we're going to be adding is a section on e-commerce. And what we mean by e-commerce is information about de minimis values, information about what are the top platforms uh, used for e-commerce in your country, as well as some information about 
how much uh, what how much e-commerce might be happening in an economy. So if you're considering new channels through e-commerce, uh, we'd like to give you um, some resources that can help you uh, make that choice. But without further ado, thank you so much for your attention. Um, I think I'm not sure, Dario. We should will we do all the questions at the end? I think right. So perhaps yes, let's I think it's our questions. And uh, and now I pass on. Well, I pass back to our moderator. Actually, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anya. It was a, it's a super user friendly tool. I really like the the presentation. Uh, Catherine, whenever you want, the, the floor is yours, but please, everyone, continue to ask your questions. Those that we can answer in the chat, we are answering them already, and those that we cannot, we will answer them at the end. So please make sure to stay tuned. I hope you enjoyed the presentation of this, uh, this tool designed for you, designed for MSMEs. And, and Catherine, the, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Dario, and thank you, Anya, for the very interesting presentation. I, I think I say this every time when we're presenting together, but each time I learn more about the Global Trade Help Desk and these presentations and how to use it. Uh, I'm very pleased, <clears throat> excuse me, to be here today, and I am happy to present to you the Trade for Miss Me's uh, web website. Um, <clears throat> this is an initiative by the Miss Me Informal Working Group of the WTO. It came about because the members of that group had heard from their constituents that there is a lot of trade information out there, but it is not always verified and it is hard to access. And so in this case, they were hoping to put it all into one place where it would be easily accessible and easily searchable. This website, I will note, is still under development. And in fact, there, a uh, revised or revamped version will be released on micro, small, and medium-sized enterprise day, which if you're not familiar with that, uh, that special holiday, it's the 27th of June every year. And at that time, we will release a new version. But in the meantime, please let me uh, walk you through the um, Trade for Miss Me's web platform as it, as it, currently, as it currently exists. So I hope you can all see my screen and it's not showing too many extra items. We Thank we you, see it Dario. <laughs> so as you will notice on uh, tradeformismes.org, which is trade for micro, small and medium-sized enterprises.org, there are two main entry points into this uh, website. And that is because it is geared both for small businesses, MSMEs, and also for policymakers and researchers. So we have these two separate si sides of the, of the website with information for both, uh, both types of users. I'm gonna begin with the small business side. If you click on this uh, link, you will be brought to our map, our trade map, which is supposed to take you on the journey of the trade process. And Anya very kindly showed how this sort of interacts with the Global Trade Help Desk. It is, here is, I think Trade for Miss Mies has been described as the Wikipedia of trade. This is where you can find more details on all of those processes that you were able to access in the Global Trade Help Desk. So, even before maybe going to the Global Trade Help Desk, you might want to start on step one, before trading goods, what should I know? And you will see here a whole list of guides that can take you through various topics that you may or may not be familiar with. So for example, Anya mentioned many times the, um, the H HS codes, and these are something that you may or may not be familiar with. You are wondering what are what are the taxes and uh, and tar tariffs and taxes at the border. If you click on this, it will take you to a guide that will explain to you what are tariffs. And you can see here, there's even a link. How do I determine my product's HS code? And this will take you to uh, even more information. Another guide just about how to find that information and, and what it means, what it is that you're looking for, and what this code actually stands for. It's an international system. It is not always clear. And these sorts of guides are, are developed here to try to help you uh, um, understand better the whole process. So that's for the that's for the um, micro, small, medium-sized enterprises. Additionally, there is a um, if you are here on this uh, original page with the roadmap, you will notice here this Miss Me library. This is um, the back end where you can search, just do a general search of the resources that are available. Some of them are sorted by various topics, the trade in goods, 
intellectual property, which is a, a subject that comes up quite a bit and is very important for small businesses, but may not be something that you are, 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 are well aware of, or more information on regional trade agreements. There's also a way of searching by region as well, uh, depending on where you are located in the world and to have resources that are most relevant to you and your business. Um, I understand that this is uh, not the most intuitive, this top button here. And indeed, this is one of the reasons why we're having a revamped version launched uh, in June, because uh, we hope that the searchability and accessibility will be easier. I want to also briefly take you through the policymaker resources because I'm not sure if, if everyone on this call is, uh, is a business or if, in fact, you might also be um, uh, related to policy in some way. Even if you're not, this has a number of resources that, that might be of interest. Um, this is uh, why it has various stops along this kind of roadmap as well, although this one is a little slightly organized differently. The very first stop is why micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises and trade. So why is it important? This has a you know a, a brief background about um, about the reasons why policymakers should care, and that's really that they are such a fundamental part of the economy. And and uh, you yourselves know as businesses that uh, you you are what drive you are what drive the national economy, and so it's important to for this sort of support. There's also policymaker guides, just like for the small businesses. And these are on topics that come up repeatedly. I think one that uh, um, uh, uh, that's that's frequently mentioned is um, the digital economy, and we have a number of different topics on digitalization for for policymakers. So if you were to click on one of these guides, again, you're taken into another text page where it has information and various links. I realized I forgot to note that at the end of every one of the guide is sort of a summary, and this is even true for the small business pages, of various links that can take you to sources such as the OECD, such as the ITC, which has a number of tools other than the Global Trade Help Desk that are very important for, for businesses and policymakers, uh, and, and these are all tried to be brought together in, into one guide. Um, just to also note that within the policymaker roadmap, there are these other stops as well about other organized organizations that are uh, um, working on the trade and small business uh, topic, and also uh, data sources. I mean, this is really for policymakers or researchers, but it could be of interest as well to you. Um, these are where we have uh, understood that where trade information is available uh, in, in regarding how much trade is being conducted by small businesses and their um, their uh, 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 yeah, impact in the world. I think with that, I have, I've mostly showed what's available here. Uh, again, policymakers also have a, uh, um, a library, a policymaker library. Um, this is what's being worked on to, to sort of improve the, uh, the searchability and navigation. And on the home page as well, um, in the future, uh, you will be able, there will be more information on recent events in the, in the upcoming web page, but I do want to highlight that if you're interested in receiving more information about the developments for the web page, you're welcome to subscribe here for updates or to contact us if you have other information that you think would be relevant to include on the website. And so with that, I will, I will stop here. Thank you so much, Catherine. I was actually subscribing to to updates right now. Thank you for the for the presentation. It, it and I'm really looking forward to see the new the new version coming up in just a, a few months. Uh, I think we have a few more questions in 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 the chat and in the Q and A function. So please continue to ask them. Um, Catherine, if uh, if everything is is done on your side, maybe we can go to to Claire, who also has an amazing. Uh, an interesting presentation for us today. So Claire, whenever you want, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Daria. And welcome to everybody. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to discuss the legal entity identifier today with such a large and diverse group coming from around the world. I like to uh, give a bit of scope and understanding for why we, the Global LEI Foundation, are here today. Uh, the presentations so far by Anya and by Katrin are fabulous in giving you the wealth of information now easily accessible 
together in these resources. And my focus here will be much more limited, and that will be identity. And you may think to yourself, well, how does that relate to the broader question, accessibility of information on markets, on policies, et cetera? And I like to start by giving a statistic. And that comes from the Asian Development Bank, their uh, Trade Finance Gaps, Growth and Jobs Survey. Probably you have heard this, it was published in 2021 and it is often quoted in the area of trade finance. And the Asian Development Bank identifies that there is a 1.7 billion US dollar trade finance gap existing in the world. That has only increased over time. And if you look according to their survey at the types of entities that suffer most from trade finance application rejections, it is small businesses. And one of the issues there is the ability to easily understand from those institutions that are offering trade finance, financial institutions, for et cetera, who exactly is that small business that, and are they a credit worthy organization? So with that, I will move to the presentation. And you will see here first that very same theme uh, echoed in a recent publication coming from the WTO and the World Economic Forum. Without a unique and globally harmonized identifier, finding information about a small business in a sea of metadata is difficult, if not impossible. And that is where this legal entity identifier can play a role to help solve the problem. So the LEI can drive more transparency and underpin the promise of financial technology to create greater inclusion for small businesses in the global economy. So that you will find is the theme of my presentation today. How can a globally unique regulatory endorsed an open system for legal entity identification drive financial inclusion and discovery for small businesses? I give you a bit of background on what is this legal entity identifier and then myself, the Global Legal Entity Identifier Foundation, what do we do and, and what is the overall system meaning for you? So the GLIF, you can call us as a short name, we are a not-for-profit Swiss foundation that are founded by the Financial Stability Board. We are overseen by a group of regulators referred to as the Regulatory Oversight Committee. So this is over 70 regulators coming from around the world, all continents, to drive the growth, the policy, and the implementation of this global system for legal entity identification. We are over also overseen by a board of independent directors, and we as a foundation are responsible for the operations of the global LEI system. Specifically, that is the oversight of our 39 accredited partners. So we call these organizations LEI issuers or LOUs that are providing the LEI issuance and renewal services. These organizations are accredited, meaning they need to demonstrate their ability to verify, validate, and know what makes a legal entity a legal entity at the local level and they can provide their services locally, regionally, or internationally, depending upon the business model. A very important point to note, uh, we are a not-for-profit foundation, but the entire system operates under the principle of cost recovery. This is a very important principle that is in the founding charter coming from the Financial Stability Board and part of the oversight program of our regulatory oversight committee. To date, there are a little more than 2.3 million LEIs issued. All of this data is open public data, accessible without any IP or copyright protection. And we, as the foundation, we are collecting the information on LEIs from our LEI issuers or LOUs several times a day and publishing that information via the Glyph website, easily acceptable, uh, easily accessible as a website search for the humans like us that are going to just look one by one, but also then for easier machine processing as an API or a full file download. The LEI itself is an international standard. Here you have a snapshot of the core reference data that is associated with it. So there is the basic information of the 
name that could be translated, transliterated, depending upon the language set. Also information address, customer due diligence information on validation, and then links to the direct and the ultimate accounting consolidation parents and children. Importantly, the LEI serves as a global identifier, furthering the idea there should be one global identity behind every business, but it serves as an umbrella. So specifically within the LEI record, you find the link always to the local registration authority. So what is the local authority that gives the identity to the business and also to other important systems. For example, we have links to the big code, which is used within payments, to ISINs, which are used for security instruments, for to other data vendors like S&P. And then most importantly and interestingly, we also just recently announced a collaboration with Open Corporates, which is also another open source database for further information on corporate information. The global LEI system to date has grown through regulation, and this is the role of that regulatory oversight committee to include the LEI in different rulemakings for its use in counterparty or facilitator reporting. You'll see that many of these regulations to date are focusing on financial markets, financial transactions, but we do see already some use of the LEI within customs. Uh, in particular, in China, you have the LEI being requested for 29 different countries that are importing into China. And uh, very interestingly, the United States Custom Border Protection has launched in December 2022 an evaluative proof of concept titled Global Business Identifier. The purpose of this initiative is to better pinpoint high-risk shipments to create a common language that can overcome barriers between government and industry communication and also data quality to ensure the right information is being collected with the right quality for better identification enforcement and risk assessment. And there you will find that the LEI is one of the identifiers being tested in this evaluative proof of concept. Why did the regulators, these custom authorities, look to the LEI? Well, it is the reality of the increasing complexities that we have in global supply chain. With globalization, especially e-commerce, it becomes more difficult to precisely identify who are the entities evolved and also to be able to harmonize that information when moving across the jurisdictions. From the private sector perspective, there is constantly evolving regulations, as we've also seen from the resources that Anya and Katrin have, have displayed to us and the documentation requirements. So the purpose here of the LEI is to focus on a unique identifier that can reduce some of these complexities in identifying entities, but also building a bridge to digital. Uh, so beyond just the 20 digit alphanumeric code, there is a need to present a global identifier in a way that enables authentication, authorization and attestation so that parties can start to interact in a trusted way digitally. And lastly, the links between the financial sector and the global supply chain. And I will give you a feeling for that in just a moment as we go into uh, more broadly the usage of the LEI and how that links to the supply chain. First, I'd like to pivot briefly to the idea of digital identities. So the GLIFE, the LEI, is involved in the International Chamber of Commerce, their digital standards initiative. This is an initiative that brings together private sector and government entities from around the world to advance digitization in trade processes. There was just at end of March, a major event called the Future Trade Forum in Singapore. And there the first deliverables of the ICC DSI initiative were released. This includes the trusted technologies principle, which refers to the VLEI, which is the digital twin of the VLEI. There was also a document world published by the World Trade Board, Financial Inclusion in Trade, where you will find the LEI as a critical piece or support to digital identities. And then lastly, a broader research piece produced by GLIFE and ITC 
that is focusing on the role of digital identities within trade. One other important publication that came out last year, but has also been widely uh, moved forward within the ICC DSI initiative is a document titled Shutting Fraudsters Out of Trade, which demonstrates how the LEI can help to expose fraud along the supply chain. The role of the LEI in digital identities, I mentioned there is this digital twin called the VLEI. The purpose there is to enable organizations to create a digital wallet that links the organization, the person, and the roles. That would therefore facilitate the concepts of authentication, authorization, and attestation to documents, exchange of goods, et cetera, along the supply chain. And this is very important. You have the LEI, that 20 digit alphanumeric code that can be used for simple exchange of information, for aggregating information across different resources. And then you have the VLEI, which takes that 20 digit alphanumeric code and cryptographically binds it to the entity or to the person taking some action on behalf of the entity. And we see that as being a very interesting product within the supply chain as today, there is no consistent harmonized international approach to authentication, authorization and attestation. I'd like to um, move to the final piece of the presentation and give you a practical example and feel for how the LEI, this global identifier, can bridge information sessions and also enable easy information exchange on the basics. Who am I doing business with? So I go back to the link between the supply chain, the financial sector, um, and I highlight here a very important work item for us as an organization, and this is something called the Cross-Border Payments Roadmap. This is an initiative put forward by the leaders of the G20 nations in November of 2020. The purpose is to render cross-border payments more transparent, more efficient, less expensive, and more inclusive. The LEI is an important building block or an important element of the overall cross-border payments roadmap and vision, specifically in the work on a globally unique identifier for payment originators and beneficiaries. Specifically, the Financial Stability Board has published a recommendation document that describes the LEI as an important tool for customer due diligence, also for sanctions list publications and encourages all of its member states to leverage the LEI in payments legislation, including mandates for originator beneficiaries going forward. As a result of this and some of the work we are doing, we have created this small demonstration so that people can have a feel for what does this global identifier do to facilitate discovery. If you take out your phone and you take a quick scan here of the QR code, you will get to a page that gives the basic information on an e-invoice. So the idea here is to simulate an exchange of an e-invoice, a supplier giving that to, its, uh, to it, the organization to which it provides its services. And here it is the, uh, it is the originator of the payment that has scanned this e-invoice via a QR code and is now seeing in its payment app the basic information associated with the e-invoice. So for those of you that have pulled up the screen, you will see the first information is that associated with the beneficiary. In this case, it is an organization called Hitachi in Japan. And you see information on the legal name in both the local character set, as well as a transliteration to Latin characters, Hitachi. And next to Hitachi, you will see a little chain. If you click on that chain, that will bring you to the global LEI index. This is a link that is facilitated by the open public API that we as an organization are responsible to facilitate free of charge without any login. And we are responsible to facilitate this as part of our mandate coming from the regulators. 
The information you find then in the global LEI index gives you the basics on the name. As you scroll down through there, links to other identification systems, importantly, the local company register, the S&P global ID, some of the securities that are associated with that entity. You then find information on the address, uh, the local address and the headquarters address, depending sometimes it can be different. And what I like to take a pause on is the information in registration details. This is extremely powerful due diligence information. The global LEI system is unique. It provides the information on when the reference data associated with the LEI was validated, where it was validated, the local company registry, when was it last updated, and when is it scheduled for its next renewal. You will not find this type of transparency in any vendor product. Uh, Anya mentioned Dun & Bradstreet earlier in some of her presentation. The drawback there is, well, there's no knowledge of when was the last time the information associated with the entity was validated, verified, etc. So this is extremely powerful information that can be used to build different risk views, for example, of an entity one is interested to do business with. And then if you scroll down to the bottom, you start to see the corporate hierarchy of Hitachi based on an accounting consolidation principle. And you can click on any one of those associated entities and find the same exact data structure. So I like to show that uh, just to give a feel, the power of open public data, any organization, any innovative fintech, innovative trade technology firm could leverage the open public API to build, for example, a risk profile around an entity based on some of that information in the LEI, links to other uh, information and operating systems. So it's an extremely powerful tool to enable a better understanding of the small business in particular that an organization might be interested in engaging. I will end the presentation there uh, with that practical example and turn back to Dario for the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Claire. It was super clear. And I think this is not only the present, but very much the future for, for MSMEs and firms across the world. I think this can be a great game changer. And it was very fun to, to scan the, the small QR code. Um, we have so many interesting questions, uh, some we have already answered to. We have a few for Anya, a few for Katrin. I think so far we don't have questions about the LEI, but I'm sure there are a few details that you might need clarifications on. So please feel free to type in all your chats, uh, all your questions in the chat about the, the LEI. Uh, maybe I can begin with a question for Anya. Anya, we, we had a question earlier on. Uh, about the status on bilateral agreements. Uh, is it on the Global Trade Help Desk? Does the Global Trade Help Desk give status on bilateral agreements? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, if you'd like to see the status of a bilateral agreement like that's been signed, but perhaps isn't yet enforced, um, this is something that we can see on uh, something called Rules of Origin Facilitator. Uh, which is another ITC tool. Global Trade Help Desk uh, shows the um, information for trade agreements that have already been processed and are in force, and for which we have all of the rules of origin information as well. Um, so uh, it won't show you a uh, agreement that's perhaps signed but not yet implemented, for instance. But um, I can, if you allow me to share my screen quickly, perhaps I could uh, show um, show an example on rules of origin facilitator uh, quickly in case that's useful. Um, so it's on find rules of origin. Um, .com .org is the rules of origin facilitator. And if you look under agreements, under the agreements tab, um, let me zoom in there for a bit for you. And then we can, for instance, here we see all uh, that are uh, actually covered in, in the tool, but we can select our country if we go with India once again, just to be consistent. And then we can see uh, which are in force, but we can also just see um, all of the uh, all of the agreements that are signed in force, being negotiated, inactive, we can see all of the details 
um, for all of the trade agreements that are relevant for India. So this is where you would find that type of detailed information across about the status of a bilateral trade agreement. Whereas in Global Trade Help Desk, you'll find the information about the ones that are already in force and active um, for the search that you are conducting. I hope that's clear. <laughs> it was super clear to me at least, but Amit, if it's not clear, thank you for your question and, and please let us know if it's if it's not clear. Uh, maybe I can ask you a second question, Anya, and then we'll turn to a question for, for Katrin. Uh, and please continue to type your questions. Uh, Anya, we have a second question about um, the global trade help. So is there any way to get an overview or ranking of which market is the most promising for a product and how? So I believe this talks a bit about uh, export potential, the export potential section on, on the global trade help desk. Uh, thank you, Dario. So indeed, uh, when we were doing our search uh, for tablecloths, for instance, um, and when if we hit the find markets button, we get information from ITC export potential map. And this is a forward looking uh, forecasting tool um, that gives us the benchmark, uh, let's say expected level of trade based on all of the quantifiable criteria that we can think of. So looking at um, trade performance, looking at uh, all of the relevant tariffs, uh, looking at distance, looking at economic growth, population growth, global demand, um, all of these factors are um, are put in an, in an economic model, and we have these benchmark um, levels of expected trade. And using this in Global Trade Help Desk, we propose the top 10 uh, markets in terms of total export potential. So um, this is where you can find, uh, if you want to use the economic criteria and compare you know, how much additional exports you might expect across certain markets, this is how you can find that. Um, you can also go, if you're interested in, in deeper analysis at the country level, you can go to export potential map. Um, perhaps I can also share my screen there for a moment. Um, so beyond, if you'd like more details, um, you can go to export potential map. Uh, ITC export potential map. And here we can see a few different perspectives. So for instance, if we're not interested, if we already kind of know which markets are attractive, but we'd like to compare what are the most attractive products across a country for export. Um, here, if we type in India once again, um, we can see the top 50 uh, products with the greatest export potential from India. Um, so I'm sorry if you can't see this very well, but the size of the squares represents the export potential. The different sectors have different colors and the shaded area represents what's already being exported. And the light area is kind of shows additional room for growth. So we can see that diamond, jewelry, medicines, uh, shrimp, rice, um, there's a lot of different products with potential. So this is another source if you'd really like to have an overview um, at the product level and also at the market level. But once again, this is one of the sources that's integrated into Global Trade Help Desk so that instead of jumping through 14 different tools, you only go to one, but you can also find more, um, more detailed information. And if you have any questions about how to use these tools, please don't uh, hesitate to reach out to us also bilaterally by email. Thank you very much, Anya. It, it, it was very clear and another ITC tool that, that is very, very interesting. And I'm sure everyone was very glad to, to get to know it. C Catherine, if I may, I would have a question for you. Uh, this question comes from Bidi Ikena. Uh, it's about platforms created by WTO for SMEs. So I believe we already presented one, but specifically the question is asking, um, is there a platform created by WTO to register global SMEs where financial aid, monitoring of growth and other assistance can be accessible easy, easily? I don't know if you have any elements to, to answer this question. Uh, well, thank you very much for the question. And unfortunately, I, I don't have an answer that says yes, that that, that exists. Um, the WTO, <clears throat> it, I think the micro, small and medium sized enterprise informal working group is a little bit of an exception to the WTO in general, because we do like to speak directly with businesses and small businesses and their representatives in particular. This is really so that we can understand what the challenges are. And in fact, just yesterday, we had our annual meeting with the private sector. And that's really where this interaction comes from uh, in principle. Um, <clears throat> but regarding a platform, it is really just the trade for Miss Me's website. 
the WTO, <clears throat> excuse me, is not involved in registering businesses. This is really more for Claire Rowley. Um, these sorts of initiatives, though, there are a lot. And in fact, there are various uh, national level initiatives as well in terms of business registration um, and a support for small businesses. And this was kind of highlighted in the meeting that we had yesterday that there is an, a general interest in knowing more about what national economies are doing for their small businesses in terms of trade and what programs are out there precisely as the question asked. So this is something that I think we'll consider the small business group that is uh, at the WTO um, because again, it, it ties in very closely with the Trade from Ismi's platform, which is trying to bring together all of these disparate pieces of information into one central location where you can find it more easily. Um, so thank you for that. And it's something that we'll take into consideration. Thank you very much, Catherine. It, it was very clear. Please let us know in the chat if it wasn't, but to me, it, it was very clear. So I would like to ask a, a question to, to Claire now. Claire, we have a very short, but very direct question for, for you that comes from, uh, from an anonymous attendee, actually. Um, for the LEI, uh, does the LEI help to reduce the risk of scams? Yes, I share my screen briefly. So focusing again on payments, this just gives you an example, but you could use it for other information flows. So in 2021, there is a paper coming from SWIFT, which is an international payments network, uh, that describing how the LEI could be leveraged within payment messages to reduce fraud and scams. Uh, here's the two examples, enhanced fraud and vendor scam reduction and enhanced corporate invoice reconciliation. What this is leveraging is again, the idea of digital identity. So documents or information exchange like emails where the LEI is leveraged in the document to identify the party that is, for example, requesting a change to an account number in an ERC, ERP system. And that LEI then corresponding to a digital seal to that request. That could be a digital certificate. It could be a company seal, depending the local legislation and what is the preferred trust product, it could also be a verifiable credential. The idea being by having the LEI leveraged within that seal, so the cryptographically binding validated information associating the entity to the application of that seal, and then also in the information exchange. So maybe it's the e-invoice document, maybe it's the email requesting an account change, there is then an ability in a completely automated way to connect the information and know that the request for the change that the e-invoice being sent is actually associated with the firm that prepared that request. So specifically, this is looking to address payment push fraud. Many of you have heard of this. This is where there is impersonation, email chains that are intercepted, and then a fraudster will change a company name. So it looks very similar to the company that the organization is doing business with, and then tricks the organization into making payment into an account that is not at all associated with the supplier. So that's just an example of how a 20-digit alphanumeric code, instead of using names, addresses, which have all sorts of interpretations, languages, et cetera, that can significantly reduce the window of opportunity for fraud. Thank you very much, uh, Claire, for, for this very precise answer. Um, we still have a few questions um, for Anya, if you wish. Uh, we have a question about the IFCFTA uh, and specifically what specific services and tools has the Global Trade Hub Desk provided to simplify logistics and compliance uh, process related to the IFCFTA at this in incipient stage. Thank you so much, Dario, for the question. Um, I think the AFCFTA is a really uh, ambitious and exciting exercise that is unfortunately not moving as quickly as we all hoped. Um, I wish that for the moment we could have um, the tariff schedules uh, related to the AFCFTA already incorporated, but from what I understand, those are not yet finalized for all products and they're still 
um, some rules of origin and some things that are uh, still being tweaked. Uh, but as soon as we have those, those will also be uh, processed and uh, integrated into the Global Trade Help Desk. Um, I also wanted to flag that we have a, a regional tool called the African Trade Observatory, um, which focuses specifically on intra-regional trade in Africa and also highlights opportunities um, so this is also something I would encourage you to, um, to look at. Uh, I think if you want to use Global Trade Help Desk at this point, I think what it's really helpful for is really giving you access to um, the available information on intra-African trade. We have uh, the most comprehensive data that we uh, that possible at ITC. And so in terms of if you want to already explore, especially using export potential and, and, and kind of identifying new opportunities across products in Africa, um, this is already possible and you can um, so you can get started there and also in terms of logistics uh, with information on freight forwarders um, this can also be uh, one aspect but um, definitely stay tuned because there will be much more information incorporated um, at each stage and this is certainly something that um, we prioritize and are working towards so thank you for the question Thank you indeed for the question, Tavershima. I believe Claire answered to a question uh, about trade digitalization in the chat. If there is any need to, to answer to this question further, please let us know. I also would like to answer to two questions that has been uh, that have been widely asked to Adelia. The first one, will we share the recording and presentation? Yes, we will share them to everyone who registered for this webinar. And the second one, if you wish to contact us, uh, Anya put the Global Trade Help Desk email and her personal email in the chat. So please feel free to, to, take, uh, to take notes and, and uh, you can contact us through this email. Um, I'm not sure there are any more questions. I believe, Anya, at some point there was one about accessing uh, business director information on the Global Trade Help Desk. Uh, maybe you can say a few words about this. And if there are any other concluding questions, please put them in the Q&A now because we will, we will soon uh, conclude the session. Um, thank you, Dario. So on the company information access, uh, so we have two types of business directory information in the Global Trade Help Desk. Uh, one comes from Connect Americas, um, and that information is freely accessible. And then an, a second source is actually from TradeMap, from Dun & Bradstreet and Compass. And this requires a login through TradeMap, which, as I said, is free for most countries, but you do need to register for a market analysis account. So once you are registered there, it goes seamlessly within Global Trade Help Desk. Uh, so I hope that's clear. It's very clear. And, and for everyone interested, I see there is a voluntary initiative to create a, a WhatsApp group chat to, to connect with each other and help each other. So, so please check the link that, that Mehul kindly shared. Uh, thank you, Anya. I believe we've answered to most questions unless I've forgotten uh, uh, anything. Uh, it was a very interesting webinar. I was very happy to see all, all this presentation. And I hope uh, everyone uh, attending today was also uh, interested and could, could benefit from, from this webinar. Um, I see someone raised their hand. Is it, uh, is it an additional question? Raja Ranjan, you raised your hand. If you, if you have a question, maybe can you kindly type it in the chat quickly? Um, otherwise, once again, thank you very much for, uh, for attending this webinar today. Let's, let's wait just a few seconds to see if any concluding question comes. Otherwise, we are perfectly on time to, to conclude this, this webinar. Once again, we were with Claire from the Global Legal Entity Identifier Foundation, who presented us the Legal Entity Identifier, a tool that I really suggest everyone to, to check because it can really be a game changer for your firm. Catherine from the World Trade Organization presented us the Trade for MSMEs, a uh, very useful and very interesting platform that is actually uh, that was created also uh, by the uh, WTO Informal Working Group on, on MSMEs. And Anya kindly introduced us to the Global Trade Help Desk and also to a few other ITC tools in the, in the Q&A session. And uh, Raja Ranjan typed a question, maybe can be the concluding question. Um, is there any way to know the demand map if it is not a generic product, but a specific product? I don't know what, what would be the, def the difference between a generic product, but a, a specific product. But I believe to, to get uh, more trade statistics and get to know the demand more, you can first refine uh, your HS code search through the HS finder in, in the Global Trade Help Desk. And maybe we can say a few words, uh, I don't know, about trade map. Um, Anya, do you wish to, to give a few, a few insights about this question, about how to get more insights about demand for products? 
Um, sure. I so at within Global Trade Help Desk, we show information at the six digit level. So this is a bit aggregated relative, and there are additional, let's say, tariff line information at the country level. To make it comparable across countries, we stay at the six digit level. If you would like to have very detailed national tariff line information, this is available in ITC Trade Map. Um, and uh, if Perhaps Adelia, if you could kindly put the um, ITC Market Analysis YouTube channel in the in the chat. Um, there's a number of tutorials on how to use TradeMap and how to easily access this information, so that um, you can also have a look at that in case it's of interest to additional participants. But thank you so much for the question, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, for attending the webinar. So hi, I would like to thank uh, once again. Oh, Claire, maybe you wish to say something. Um, no, just to say thank you. <laughs> Well, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, but thank you as well for the attendance today. A pleasure to, to join. I see that uh, Adelia has magically made all the link appeared in, in the chat. Thank you very much, Adelia, for all your, your assistance today. Thank you, Claire, for being with us today. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Anya. And thank you, and, Dario. And I believe we can conclude this webinar here. Thank you so much for attending and see you see you very soon.